Hello, I'm Caroline West and welcome to this program on Eye Health, The Current View, coming to you on the Rural Health Channel 600. Now with World Sight Day coming up this Thursday the 11th of October, we're reminded that most vision loss is preventable and treatable and regular eye examinations are really the key to early detection. There are particular issues and risks for people in rural Australia and there is a high incidence of eye trauma amongst our farming communities. In this program, we'll take a look at the typical presentations to rural primary health care practice and review the glaucoma guidelines and the latest treatment for macular degeneration as well as other common eye problems. This is a professionally accredited program from the Rural Health Education Foundation. And more information about the channel can be found on the Foundation's website. So go to the web www.rhef.com.au forward slash RHC. And with all our live programs, you can ask questions of the panel by email, phone or fax. Now, I'll be endeavouring to put your questions forward, so send them through now. And the details are coming up on the screen. You can send your emails to questions at rhef.com.au or phone us on our toll-free line 1800 817 268. And you can also fax your questions to us 1800 633 410. As usual, there are a number of really useful resources available on the Rural Health Education Foundation's website. Once again, go to rhef.com.au. Now, let's start this evening by meeting our wonderful panel. And to start off with, we have Phil Anderton. He was a research optometrist and vision scientist at the University of New South Wales of Optometry before retiring in 2005, although I hear it wasn't much of a retirement. You're back in practice. <laughs> Is true. that right? That's yes. True, yes. He now practices part time as a rural optometrist in Manila, New South Wales. So, welcome. You've got a lot of experience in rural eye health. From your point of view, what should we be talking about tonight? Well, I think, I think the most important thing about rural health generally is that, because for various reasons, um, we need to work very closely as a network uh, to provide the services that are required. A multidisciplinary network, in fact. And in this case, in the case of eye health, it's the local GPs and the local optometrists working together with regional ophthalmologists and ophthalmologists visiting from city areas. So um, my message for tonight is actually to, to make sure that we work and support in multidisciplinary networks like that. Because mm, I hear that again and again, that that's one of the terrific things about rural medicine is, is that collegiality, that network of... of um team members coming together and in fact you've got a team member right next door to you John Professor John Fraser now you two work together which is just coincidence really tell us about that <laughs> well we've been working for five years Phil just remind me and we've yeah. got a nice collegiate uh, um, uh, health health uh, center and uh, building on from uh, Phil's comments it's a network yeah. so um, you know having the, that chronic care focus yeah. developing health mm. plans involving optometrists and other um, uh, health professionals. Yes, yeah. and, and of course we're speaking with John Fraser, Professor John Fraser. Now he's got a lot of experience as a rural general practitioner and a public health physician, that's right isn't it, with extensive clinical research and teaching experience in remote and rural Australia. Mm -hmm. Now you're also adjunct professor at the University of New England and visiting professor at the University of Newcastle. So welcome aboard, John, and Thank we're looking you, forward to hearing your GP perspective. Thank you so yes. much. And next on our panel is Jill Grasso. She w brings to the team a wonderful sense of experience. Um, you're a clinical nurse consultant in ophthalmology. You've worked in healthcare with healthcare professionals across all borders within Australia and overseas. That's right, Jill? Yep. You've always been in the field of ophthalmology, working in education, screening, and eye promotion eye trauma management and injury prevention. So injury management and prevention is really one of your passions, isn't it? Tell us about that. It certainly is, and it's the foundation for vision preservation, so the correct management at the time, the resources available to make those decisions, and the referral process is critical in the first stages of a trauma. So we can get the message across to our colleagues and mm -hmm. give them the resources to do that. It's just such a, it's a, it's a win-win situation for everybody. Fantastic, and hopefully yeah. tonight can extend, yeah. extend that out to a, a great network out there. And also joining us is Professor Jill Keefe, OAM, is head of the Centre of Eye Research Australia's Population Health Unit, specialising in prevention of vision loss and blindness in Australia and our region, low vision and health services research. 
Professor Keefe received an Order of Australian Medal, OAM, in 2007 for services to eye care education and practice. Obviously, prevention is something that, that's really very important to, to discuss tonight, isn't it? Yes, it's, we look forward to uh, certainly talking more about that. And the, the message that was developed globally for World Sight Day, about 75% of the vision loss and blindness being either preventable or treatable, is just as relevant for all across Australia. Mm -hmm. So to be able to um, use the opportunities we have with patients to yep, ask the right questions. Yes, because I think a lot of people would be surprised by that figure, wouldn't they? But yes, yes. That, um, Yes, certainly the most common causes we can um, either, we often can't prevent the disease, but we can um, treat or prevent the vision loss. And, and that's the really important message. Fantastic. Mm. And next we have Professor Hugh Taylor AC, is Melbourne Laureate Professor at the University of Melbourne. Welcome aboard. He founded the Centre for Eye Research Australia and has been a board member of the Fred Hollows Foundation, the River Blindness Foundation and the Vision CRC. His current work is in Aboriginal eye health and the elimination of trachoma. Welcome to you all. And where are we up to with uh, trachoma? It's a very interesting area, isn't it? Uh, well, there's uh, a lot of work to do, but uh, uh, with the commitment made in 2009 uh, to eliminate trachoma in Australia, there is some real progress being made. And certainly in some of the remote uh, communities in outback Australia, the rates of trachoma in children are dropping quite dramatically over the last year or two. Mm, that's fantastically good news. Perhaps I can just stay with you for a moment, Hugh, and you can give me an overview of what's the current state of health, of, of eye health in Australia. Well, looking at Australia as a whole, there are about uh, 50,000 people who are blind, legally blind, and about half a million people who have uh, poor vision. And remember, three quarters of that vision loss is unnecessary, can either be prevented or treated. Mm. So that We've still got a lot of work to, to go, but compared to the rest of the world, Australia is actually doing pretty well. So in some ways the glass is both half full and half, it can be seen to be uh, half empty. But in the rest of the world, um, the major cause of blindness again are preventable causes, things like cataract particularly, the need for a pair of glasses, whether for distance or for near, and then conditions such as trachoma or onchocerciasis and river blindness, childhood blindness and those other factors. And it's particularly important on World Sight Day, which is on Thursday, as you mentioned, mm. to recognise what a big impact uh, vision loss has. Mm. And John, from your perspective in the rural community, what's the story there? Is it, is it very different between urban and rural communities in Australia? Uh, we have the same conditions. I guess the issue is that um, it's one of access to health services. And often because uh, people have to travel a long way or have to weigh up uh, work and other commitments, whatever, that you often see delayed presentations. Plus we have uh, farming and other industries in that rural area we, which impact upon some of the presentations such as injury. Yes, Jill, mm. do you find that in rural communities that you get um, certain types of eye trauma more commonly? Most definitely. Yeah. It depends on the, on the season as well. It depends on mm. what they're doing at that time. So what, what would be some of the seasonal injuries that you'd expect to see? Certainly um, during the fencing season, fixing up fences, a lot of high tension wire, uh, trauma that way. Um, a lot of hammering um, metal upon metal, repairing equipment late at night mm -hmm. to get up the next morning for the harvest. That's a very common one. Um, uh, just generally um, lots of people not wearing protective eyewear or wearing their own glasses thinking they're protection so you get a lot of trauma from that. Mm. Um, yeah. Seatbelts have made a big difference but on the farm sometimes they actually don't wear their seatbelts so you can actually have a lot of people in the you know, windscreen and, and glass and stuff. Mm -hmm. So it's a variety of things but certainly it's very seasonal what we see sometimes. Okay. So we do sometimes see more of the the injury group in, in a rural community. What about in other areas when it comes to preventable eye disease? Do we see other risk factors more so in rural communities? Jill, Keith, what about smoking in rural communities? Is, is that of concern when it comes to prevention? I, I think most of the risk factors are the same, that, um, you know, particularly it's age and obviously diabetes, but importantly family history. But uh, one of the risk factors particularly that John mentioned is access. Um, and the work that um, we did um, in the Visual Impairment Project um, was finding that men were less likely to access services. So I, I think yeah, a really important message for GPs that you know, if you've got you know, men in these 
risk ages or other risk factors when they're there? Ask them the questions. So that's really mm. interesting. Why is it that, that um, men were less likely to access health services? Um, think? I, I think the barriers that John spoke about, and um, we've done a lot of work looking at um, barriers um, to seeking eye care, and it is. It's whether you can take a day off, and certainly if you've got a vision problem, you can't drive yourself. So you need someone to take you. So there's a whole lot of sort of social factors as well as cost. Um, and yeah, people not realising necessarily that something can be done to you know, quite often treat or um, restore vision. Mm, mm. Or, or sometimes underestimating the seriousness of a small foreign body, but if that was rust and left in the eye for some time, mm. you could have mm. significant damage. Yeah, mm. yeah. yeah. you'd probably see that, Phil, too. Yes, quite frequently. But I was just going to say that with the, in the case of smoking, there's been some recent data from COAG that, in, that while smoking is declining in Australia, it's not actually declining in rural Australia. It's staying at the same level. So, uh, I don't quite know why that is the case, but um, smoking is a risk factor for many diseases, including um, the chronic degenerative eye disease. So is doing. this something we need to be talking more to our patients well, about, just keeping absolutely, that? Absolutely, yeah, a along with you know, other measures which can slow down the progress of, of chronic disease in general, such as exercise and diet and mm. the normal, the normal mm. things that mm. uh, we do. Well, just to mention, sometimes I might see one of these male farmers to get reading glasses and I say, when's the last time you saw the doctor? And he'll say, oh, I don't need to see the doctor, you know, I'm pretty tough. And I'll look in his eye and I'll see signs of cardiovascular disease, which you can see in the eye, mm. uh, arteriosclerosis. And I'll say, sorry, mate, but your time's up. Mm. You've got to go and see this my GP friend, and mm. so it, it works two ways. Mm. Yeah, yeah. So. so that's very true, isn't it? Yeah. 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 And, and what about from the, the Aboriginal perspective, Hugh? Well, well, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, uh, children, have much better vision than mainstream kids. Uh, they have much less short-sightedness, and in fact the acuity is often much, much sharper, much better than uh, Caucasian. But by the time they reach the age of 40, the uh, Aboriginal adults will have six times as much blindness and more than three times as much vision loss. Mm. And 94% of that vision loss, again, is unnecessary, being mm. preventable or treatable. Mm -hmm. And so there's a huge gap in vision. Mm. And in fact, 11% uh, of the health gap is due to vision loss. It's behind cardiovascular disease and diabetes, but equal with trauma and ahead of alcoholism and stroke. And unlike those other conditions, which are long-term chronic difficult conditions to manage, much of the vision loss can be corrected overnight. You give somebody a pair of glasses, they see right away. You do cataract surgery, they see the next day. Mm -hmm. So that's something that's very much amenable to immediate intervention, mm -hmm. which would have a huge impact. Mm -hmm. so, so really mm -hmm. talking about how important prevention is, and can you, can you tell us more about that? Well, it, it's prevention uh, or, or timely treatment. So for cataract, you know, you can reduce the risk of developing cataract with sunglasses and, smoke, and stopping smoking and so forth. But everybody will develop cataract if they live long enough. And so the prevention of cataract blindness is not so much the prevention of cataract, but making sure that there's timely surgery. And if somebody, you're not going to prevent presbyopia unless you line up everybody and shoot them at the age of 40. <laughs> <laughs> oh, uh, there's, a, there's a plan. <laughs> sure but you know, like but, that but we rejected that plan. <laughs> <laughs> but, but the prevention of that disability is to give them a pair of reading glasses mm. that you can do for a couple of dollars and suddenly they can mm. see properly. Mm. So that, so that it's, it's that treatment uh, or, or early treatment or prevention of the disability that's the, the uh, ki uh, critical thing that mm. makes it so cost effective. Yes, yes. And when it comes to also Indigenous um, communities and Indigenous eye health, of course we do have programs that viewers can access via our website. The See Strong Focus on Indigenous Eye Health is, is a fantastic program. I actually had a look at this uh, recently and I was really engaged by the way the story was put together of people working in these communities and getting back to your trachoma work and how powerful those interventions are in communities with simple message. So, but let's move on to our, our first case study. Now let's uh, take a look at Carl. Now he's a 52-year-old wheat farmer from Western Australia who presents to his rural general practitioner. Now he's complaining of sore eyes and he's finding it hard to focus and read and he thinks that he might need glasses. He often experiences high levels of dust on the farm. So what do you think might be going on here, John? You're his GP, well, what do you think? Carol, it's, it's already ringing red flags because as we said, men tend not to access 
health services, unless they're particularly concerned or, or worried at this age group of 52. So while it may be as simple as a, an allergic conjunctivitis or uh, presbyopia at this age, we need to really assess him and have a thorough history and, and examination. Um, his family history is very important. Are there history of, is there a history of diabetes, for example, or glaucoma? We, we need to uh, do an examination where we are going to assess his visual acuity, but also uh, try to have a look, good look at his fundus. And from that, uh, try to um, ascertain what, uh, what's going on, but also begin to emphasise this message of prevention. Mm. So this presentation w w gives us opportunities as a GP, not just for eye health, but a lot of those broader risk factors. Mm. So so it's interesting, isn't it? He's walked in your door and you've almost got him captive. It's an opportunistic Very much so. consultation, isn't yeah. it, Hugh? What, what on that, that sort of area of family history, how else could we tease that out of someone? Do they necessarily know that their grandmother had glaucoma, do you think? No. When you talk about glaucoma, often they don't know. In fact, it's one of our failings as ophthalmologists, optometrists, GPs, pharmacists, that we give somebody a, a bottle of, or a repeat prescription for their bottle of glaucoma drops but we don't say to them, hey, you've got glaucoma and your first degree relatives are at eightfold increase of developing glaucoma too. So you must tell your brothers and sisters and your sons and daughters when they go for an eye exam that they tell the practitioner that they have a family history of glaucoma. Mm. So that uh, if somebody who doesn't know their family history, the, you know, the best way a GP is going to pick it up is to look in the back of their eye and see the coupling of the optic disc. That's not a terribly sensitive way, but it is a way that a GP can readily do that. Mm -hmm. and, and encourage that message of you may not have symptoms. You know, this is something you've mm. still got to review. Glaucoma um, is classically known as that silent thief of sight. That mm. people don't know they've got glaucoma until they go blind. I'm just two weeks ago, I had a colleague of mine, an ocular pathologist, call up and say, hey, I've got something in my eye. And the ophthalmologist I saw said, I'm almost blind in one eye from glaucoma. So here's a guy who's lived and worked in that mm. field, unknowing, not knowing a family history, mm. who's got quite significant loss at mm. a very young age. Yeah. <laughs> so, so I guess that you, you've put glaucoma on the radar, is that what you've said? You, you, you're going through a whole list of possibilities, but I guess glaucoma is one of those things you'd like to think about. When it comes to actually investigating somebody for glaucoma, Phil, perhaps you could comment on, on what we need to, to do then. I guess it would be lovely if just in our general practices we could come up with some range of investigations, but that's not quite going to cut it, is it? What, what do we need to actually do? Well, if John were to send Carl to me for an opinion, um, if I hadn't seen him before, I'd be um, vigilant for all of these chronic conditions which can appear, including glaucoma. So that in the case of glaucoma, a careful examination of the optic disc area of his, um, of his fundus um, to see whether he has any of the, of the morphological signs. Um, and I'd be measuring his intraocular pressures as well with a, a tonometer uh, and making an assessment uh, based on that. And also in the case of the family history, just a point, I'd be asking him rather than, you know, do you have a family history of glaucoma? Is there anyone in the family who's had to have drops every night mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. every day? Yep. And then sometimes, you know, people will answer a history <laughs> in one way and then when you trigger the that memory, they think, oh yes, I did have an aunt and an uncle who, who I remember now, it was glaucoma. So, mm. um, but yes, it's, it's uh, pressures, the um, examination of the optic disc, and if it looks suspicious, um, and it sounds suspicious, if there were, for example, the family history, the pressures, uh, and, and the disc changes, then we might even there and then schedule a, a visual field examination. Which mm. is I'd, I'd be a little bit different from that. Oh yeah. good, I like and, to hear somebody and, with and a different uh, perspective. That's that half the patients with glaucoma are undiagnosed mm. and half the patients who are not diagnosed have had an eye exam by an optometrist or an ophthalmologist in the last 12 months and they've mm. been missed. Mm. The reason they've been missed, one is they don't know the family history so they're not alerting the doctor, but the real reason they're being missed is they're not having the visual field test done. And a screening visual field, something like a frequency doubling test, don't, not for the GPs, but certainly for optometrists and ophthalmologists, as a rapid screening test of very high sensitivity. Jill and I did a study in a great town for this study. It was called Seymour. Mm. 
with what a study. <laughs> no, what a really? Absolutely true. Really? We're in Australia somewhere? It, no, we're just out of Melbourne. Oh, what, a what a town to do an eye study you, on. You know. That's right. <laughs> But, but the, 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 the way to pick up these unrecognised cases is really with a frequency doubling test. Okay. Mm. Uh, we've just had a question from a, a GP in rural Queensland come through. Is there any link between um, glaucoma, open angle glaucoma, and a, a family history of myopia? Uh, very, very weak links. The, 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 um, there, is a, there is a small association, statistically significant, but not clinically significant. And, and another one from Jan, a nurse in Victoria. Are there any particular medications that are contraindicated with glaucoma or even the risk of glaucoma? So what about steroids and in terms of the actual incidence of glaucoma? Uh, certainly steroids give you secondary glaucoma mm -hmm. uh, with a rise in pressure and, and there's a, a, a varying sensitivity to that. Uh, it's not so common with systemic steroids but much more common with topical or, or ocular steroids. Mm -hmm. But uh, basically, uh, you, you, uh, the, the worry about glaucoma is, is precipitating angle closure glaucoma. And angle closure glaucoma represents only a tiny percentage, a couple of percent of all the cases with glaucoma. Mm -hmm. The vast majority of glaucoma is the primary open angle glaucoma, which is not susceptible to drugs other than steroids. Mm -hmm. Okay. And once you've made that diagnosis, what, what sort of treatment options are available? Uh, the front line or first line therapy is usually uh, uh, drops, eye drops, and they're usually the prostaglandin drops. Mm -hmm. uh, they can be used in combination with some in beta blockers or other drugs. Uh, also, people will use laser treatment to the filtration angle of the eye as, as a primary treatment or as a subsequent treatment if the drops fail to work. And then after that, there are a variety of surgical methods to try to reduce the pressure in the eye uh, with, with filtration or, or destroy, uh, other methods that may uh, uh, put a drain tube into the eye or uh, reduce the amount of aqueous produced by the ciliary body. Mm -hmm. But drops are by far the most common mm. first-line treatment. Mm. And John, from your point of view, what are the referral pathways like, being a rural practitioner, actually getting your patients in to see an ophthalmologist? Well, there again, that's the art of rural practice, being able to pick up those that need to go off straight away, so the closure of glaucomas mm -hmm. compared... But uh, it can be three to six months sometimes to... To, to get a, an eye appointment, so developing other networks with Phil and, and involving our ophthalmologist um, to, um, yeah, it, it's a matter of resources and knowing what's in your area and, and developing those networks by phone if you need to triage. Just to answer Hugh's point, that decision as to whether to um, schedule an, an appointment for an ophthalmologist um, is, an, is, a, is depends on the individual patient, you know, mm -hmm. and it depends on what the disc looks like, and it depends on the family history and the pressures, and and it's just a, you know, a, a, but we tend to be more conservative, so that I tend to do a lot of field field and uh, screenings that uh, are negative, you, <laughs> so uh, but that's better than not doing them at all. Yeah, so, fantastic. Yeah. Now, Phil, this this may be uh, our next case study, may be something mm -hmm. that's uh, very close to home for you. Uh, it involves Marg, a 70-year-old woman who presents to you as her optometrist for her regular checkup. She says she's been noticing little dark spots in the centre of her vision and her eyes have been weeping tears. Interestingly enough, she's a lifelong smoker but otherwise seems in good health. I, I don't know whether anybody can be deemed in good health as a smoker but uh, nevertheless she's not complaining of anything else. Does this sound familiar? It sounds very familiar. and. Um uh, thinking about the, the theme for tonight, um, finding people who have uh, a condition which can be treatable to prevent vision loss. What should be going through my, my mind here is um, these visual changes that she complains of, how long have they been there? What's the time course? So in taking a history, it's very important to find out whether there's been a rapid change in vision. Mm. So if, you know, it, it could be, and also to bear, I need to bear in mind all of the other things which could be affecting her vision, which may not be macular degeneration. Mm -hmm. So the, the answer to that is a careful history and uh, if I haven't seen her before, um, because of her age, I, you really can't get a view of her macula without using dilating um, drops. Mm -hmm. so, so she would have a, a dilated fundus examination, particularly mm -hmm. uh, looking at the macula, mm -hmm. and, and um, assess from then on uh, what, what she looks like. Um, 
The other thing I'd be doing with her, if I suspect that she might have macular degeneration, if I can use this, is I'd be using a, 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 a test which is, which is called a, an Amsler grid, or it's a modification of the Amsler grid there, uh, which it's just a matter of having her look at that with her reading glasses on, one eye at a time, and as she looks at it, she looks at the centre dot, and I, I say to her, why are you looking at the centre dot? Uh, notice what the grid around it looks like. Do you see any holes in the grid? Does it look distorted? Is there anything that looks, looks unusual? Mm -hmm. And just from recent experience, um, this is actually quite sensitive, picking mm. up the, the form of macular degeneration which can progress rapidly. Yes. So, Jill Keefe, can, can you talk us through with perhaps some of the graphics that we have mm. there, um, some of the visual changes that someone might experience if they had macular degeneration, if we can go to those graphics? Um, Yes, I, I think from what uh, Phil just spoke about at the very early stages in that uh, the Amsler grid, which was actually shot over the top of Dr. Amsler, who uh, had developed it. And, and, there um, is there. and in the first one um, on the left, what you've got is just some of those wavy lines, the distortion. So when, instead of the regular squares, can you start to um, see those changes? And uh, this actually comes from a PhD student of mine who has macular degeneration, who's mm -hmm. tried to simulate for um, what she found in, in the changes. So um, very subtle changes early on, but um, with hers, um, yeah, it certainly um, couldn't be treated, but uh, I think the point that was made before about the referral, and if that's a sudden change in vision, that's an urgent referral. Whereas, um, you know, and particularly now when um, certainly some patients can have treatment mm. um, to, if not reverse it, but certainly to maintain the vision. And mm. importantly, what we've got um, is a, another picture that um, just a scene in Melbourne and uh, with the, the two pictures, one of them, you've got the tram sign telling you when it's coming, the other one just um, objects missing and I think you know, for things like you know, personal safety, independence mm. as well as obviously a marker of disease, really important. So taking that to a rural setting, what sort of implications would that have say on a farm if you started to lose that central vision? What might, be you, what might you be missing, yeah. for example, when you're driving or something like yeah. that? Yeah. People talk about reading and seeing faces, but it, it is. It's um, driving, and I've heard some terribly graphic decisions, uh, you know, people descriptions about when they were driving. Oh, yes, I turned a corner. Oh, and the car disappeared, and it finally appeared <laughs> a, a, a little nice. later. So mm. um, it, it's everything that you're doing. So it's not just fine near work. It's certainly distance as well. So, um, but yeah, the really urgent if it's a, a sudden onset. But yes, need for referral. Mm -hmm. And and in terms of the risk factors, what sort of risk factors did she have in her history that you'd be thinking about in terms of macular degeneration? Um, age, certainly. Mm -hmm. But the person I was talking about um, is one of those who developed um, macular degeneration in second decade of life. So it does. It's it's quite rare but um, generally it, it's age, but also um, family history. Family history? And, and smoking. And smoking. What does smoking do to the rates of macular de degeneration? Earlier. In increases them threefold. Yeah, threefold. Threefold. Yes. So yeah. it makes a huge difference. Mm. I remember having a, a patient of mine who was in her 70s who had macular degeneration, who'd been a heavy smoker all her life. And she was really distressed because she couldn't catch buses anymore. She couldn't read Maybe the bus mm -hmm. destination yeah. and it yeah. really upset her. And she just said, gee, if I'd only understood the impact smoking mm. was, ha was having on my health. Like I think people think about cardiovascular disease, don't they? And mm -hmm. they think about lung disease. But very often they forget that there's this link between smoking and eye yeah. health. Yeah. Well, about a dozen years ago, we got that uh, graphic put on the cigarette packets with uh, smoking causes blindness. Mm -hmm. And the uh, f initial TV uh, video ad with that had the best recall of any of the quit uh, ads <laughs> for all, all, all the yeah. others. Well, that, that's powerful that uh, messaging yeah. for you. Yeah, right. Car Caroline, could I just um, mention you talked about the um, impact that it has um, on a person's life. For some people, for many people, um, there can't be either um, retention or improvement in vision. The importance of referring to organisations like Vision Australia to help um, either maintain or um, certainly help, whether it's um, magnification, is only one small part, but certainly um, devices and help to maintain independence. Because mm, what's her prognosis like? 
Well, it depends a little bit on the type of macular degeneration she has and whether it's in both eyes or just in one eye and uh, how long it's been there. The, there's been a, a dramatic breakthrough in our therapeutic abilities over the last uh, five or six years with these, the injection of these anti-VEGF, uh, VEGF drugs mm. that inhibit or slow or stop the new blood vessels growing. So for the neovascular or sometimes sort of called wet macular degeneration, these drugs can make a dramatic difference. Uh, but they may need to be repeated sort of at monthly or two monthly uh, intervals forever. And mm. so they're enormously expensive, but they do make a huge difference to a significant number of patients. But if you've got to have them at all these regular intervals, how does that play out in a rural setting, John? Very difficult. Yeah, I mean, Very hard. I have a case study of a patient I saw two years ago who presented to me because he noticed that one eye had lost vision the, over the previous day. Mm. And I looked in his eye and saw the, the, what happens when the wet version bleeds. Uh, mm. And so I immediately rang one of the ophthalmologists in the regional centre that I'm close to. And even though he's a very busy ophthalmologist, he put something aside to fit this person in that, that day. And he received his first injection that mm. day. And when I saw him, he was 6.15 and he's now 6.12 in that eye. Mm. So he's actually improved mm. a line. So mm. it, it, but yeah. half of yeah. the blindness in Australia is due to macular degeneration. Mm. Because we can't tr we can't treat it all. Mm. We we can only treat a small fraction of it. Mm -hmm. And uh, apart from the obvious one of, of distance, are there any other barriers to getting uh, early prevention messages out there? Treatment. Smoking. <laughs> <laughs> We're getting back to the, the yeah, lifestyle yeah. issues of smoking. Well, what about diet? Good I mean, diet. No, is exercise. there any kind of link there? Because I know that. Um, <laughs> I can see a few faces, mm. sort of. Uh, Jill, do you have some thoughts on that? Because that's the sort of question you get asked, isn't it? When you're in practice, right. they come and they go, what will make a difference? I, you know? I prescribe macrovision vitamins. I, our local ophthalmologists do. I don't know what the evidence says, but... Because uh, that's, that's what we'll be the asked. Evidence, the, the do you think I should is, take this? Yeah. Uh, the, the evidence is, is pretty flaky, yeah. and it's interesting, yeah. because the National Institutes of Health in the US invested $100 million on it, on a study. Mm -hmm. And the, the uh, uh, drug company that makes the... Uh, the vitamins really wants to sell their drug and the scientists say well, they really want to say they found something and the doctors when somebody comes in they don't want to say look you're going to go blind there's something we can do about you they're much happier to say hey listen take these vitamins and you know it's a good chance you'll see better but the results were, were really uh, only a sub-analysis showed an improvement which means the mm. other half of people didn't get an improvement which is why the FDA did not approve the drugs for use for the, for the treatment of macular degeneration. Mm -hmm. They're repeating the study and doing another study and the results should be out in another six months, in May next year. Mm. Um, but almost nobody takes the full dose of the ARIDS uh, 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 macu macuvite mm. uh, drug. Very expensive, uh, associated with increased risk of the vitamin uh, A, increased risk of uh, cancer, uh, so you can't take in people who smoke. Uh, the vitamin C, you just pass through. The zinc with it is associated with prostate uh, problems. Oh, you're not attention. selling this, this thing. So, <laughs> so, so, that, you so, so that if you want to believe in, in, you know, in, in buying it, that's fine. But it's a very controversial area that's been marketed well. Mm. A message from yeah. Hugh. Thank you. Thank you from one of our sponsors here. So on that note, I think we'd better move on to our third case Sorry. study before we get into any more deep water. Now, now this looks at a younger man. He's 37-year-old David and he comes to his GP with sore eyes. He reports that he developed symptoms right after doing some hay baling a couple of hours ago and he thinks a bit of dust has lodged in his eye. He could be one of your patients, Jill, by the sounds of things. He complains of a burning sensation, a scratchy feeling and has been suffering some blurred vision. As you examine his eyes, you notice a red spot, a little raised area on the white of his eye. No other significant eye or general medical history problems. What's going on here with David? John, what are your thoughts? Well, again, he, he's a male, Carolyn. And, and, <laughs> and males, Getting back to this male thing. Males tend not to come to the doctor with eye problems. And, yeah. Unless it's very... Unless somebody else has instructed them to. Or, 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 or they're deeply concerned. So mm -hmm. um, he, he is actually starting to get some blurred vision. So w the slide, is that coming up yet or...? Um, That's it. Yeah. So, okay, so, so, so we're going to take a history, but very much we want to know, has there been any additional 
uh, objects, bits of metal or whatever, hitting the eye, because mm. he may well have on the examination there's there's a, a patrigium, uh, but he may well have a second foreign body under a lid, or he may have a scratch to his cornea, or it, uh, more importantly, I would want to exclude that he hadn't had a bit of me metal penetrating the eye or something like that, mm. since it's come on so quickly. Yeah, so yeah. It, he might not have noticed his trigium, but it could also be some sort of foreign That's body. Right. So you'd yeah. have to you'd have to mm. exclude that. But mm. say you did come to decide that yes, it is a trigium. How how common is that in rural practice? Oh, it's you very common because of the exposure to the UV light. Mm. Um, now, uh, so this again the theme of prevention. This raises another issue of prevention. Um, I I have actually seen a few melanomas of eyes in my practice over the years, um, but. Also, if, if this patient is developing patrigium, uh, he could well be having other um, exposures to UV lights such as skin cancer, uh, you know, uh, cancers around the eyes or elsewhere in the body. Mm. So, so the issue of eye protection is important. Mm. And uh, yeah, yeah it, it gives an opportunity to raise uh, preventive issues for, for David. Mm. So in terms of, of, of treatment, um, we had another picture, I think, as well, of a patrigium, which may come up in a moment. But in terms of treatment options, when do we need to refer someone on who's got a tridium? It may well have been there for a long time, it's not doing much. At what point do we flag it and go, it's really time to go and see someone else about this? The first yeah. thing is to treat it symptomatically. Mm -hmm. And that's to wear uh, you know, glasses, sunglasses, to stop some of the wind and evaporation when you're outside. Mm -hmm. And also to use the artificial tears or lubricating drops. Because often, the, the, because of the raised surface of the pterygium, it'll dry out on the top and that mm -hmm. will cause the irritation. And if that keeps it uh, comfortable, uh, that's all you need to do. But if it uh, continues to be red and irritated, and particularly if it grows or if it starts to, to affect vision in any way, then it should re be removed surgically and that's done by an ophthalmologist. Mm -hmm. Now very often, um, I know this from my experience out in, in, in rural places, uh, a person will present to the pharmacist and the pharmacist often does a wonderful job in trying to triage patients as they come in. What should a pharmacist be thinking about in this situation? Well, I, I would think that, the, again, the first thing to do is to give them the artificial tears or the lubricating drops and tell them to wear sunglasses or wrap around glasses so they're not exposed to wind and dust in the same way when they're out working. And if that makes them comfortable and their vision's all right, then I think that that's all they need to do. But if they're having continuing symptoms, then they, they need to go on and see an optometrist or an ophthalmologist and get into that referral pathway. And I guess very often what happens, isn't it, that, that people self self-diagnose and self-medicate too, don't they? So they may even present to the pharmacists and, and they've already made up their own minds about what they have. Mm. Mm. Is, is that your experience, Phil? Well, it's red eye uh, differential diagnosis is actually a tricky, tricky area. And um, you know, there are so many different things that could be going on. Uh, allergic, um, viral, uh, HSV, viral, adenoviral, bacterial, um, Dry eye, it's, it's a, a huge list and it's very important that the, the ones which are dangerous be, be identified and, and sent off for appropriate management. Mm. I'd like to mention here a case, if, if you have somebody with a red sore eye who's a contact lens wearer, it's very important that they take the contact lens out and leave it out and be sent off immediately for, for examination. Um, there is good evidence that contact lens keratitis, microbial keratitis, uh, can be caused by pseudomonas, which of course isn't touched by chloramphenicol. Mm. So that needs um, ho very high level uh, management and, and medication mm -hmm. for, for treatment. And if it's not treated, um, it can penetrate the cornea and, and the eye can be lost. Mm -hmm. This is very timely that you're talking about this because we've actually had a question through from John, who's a pharmacist in rural Queensland. Is there a checklist I could be using for red eye customers? <laughs> mm. <That> well, <laughs> anybody who trained in Melbourne over about a 39 year period will have heard John Colvin's lectures <laughs> on beware of the uh, unilateral red, red eye and the trumpet blowing. Mm. Okay, uh, so, so can you come up with a checklist yeah, for well, us? Yeah, well, I mean, it, it can be conjunctivitis, mm. which can be unilateral, and it can be allergy that's sometimes more unilateral. Is that very common to see allergy in just one? Well, if people tend to rub their eyes with their dominant hand. So, you know, if you're right handed, your right eye, it, it can be. But you, those must be your last two diagnoses. You really need to exclude, first of all, keratitis, a corneal ulcer, 
whether it be from herpes or from bacterial or trauma. Or, uh, uh, trauma is another thing, whether it be a corneal foreign body or penetrating injury. Uh, inflammation of the eye, iritis or uveitis. Mm. Uh, acute glaucoma, where you've got high pressure in the mm. eye. So a, a unilateral red eye is a real warning sign for mm. a GP or a pharmacist. Don't just give them chloro drops. Don't just give them steroids. Make sure that they go off to, and, and get checked properly so you make a diagnosis before mm -hmm. you, you start treating them. Mm. So I've got um, Jeff, a GP from New South Wales, who said, most of the farming people that are in my practice would not present for a red and sore eye. Should we be organising health promotion in the practice? Yes, so getting that message yeah, out. It, it yes. Clearly, yes. 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 Or, or so by yes, the yes, and yes. And, and you should, be, should be warning them too, to, you know, to protect themselves against the yeah. foreign bodies. Yes. Yeah. Um, now it's that, that ocular trauma. Mm. Mm. And, and yeah. Yes, and we'll be coming to that in a moment with, with yeah. Jill. But um, I guess also to give us a checklist, Jill, you've also got an emergency manual. Can you tell us about that and how that might be useful to all of us who may see someone with mm -hmm. a unilateral red eye? This is a great guide. It gives you the first line management and, and assessment for your patients and the, it's uh, full of red flags so it certainly is to indicate to um, refer and uh, the urgency of referral so it's very good. It's also got an excellent section in it on the red eye mm -hmm. and the, the manner mention of that. Now it's a New South Wales Health partly it funded is. publication. Does that mean that everybody can access it? Most definitely. It's on the ACI website, mm -hmm. uh, Ministry of Health. It's a free publication and it can be downloaded at any time. Mm -hmm. So that's one of the things that you really like to have with you um, at all times to cross-reference. Most definitely. And I guess all of us like to have our um, certain bags of tricks. And Phil, you've, yeah. you've certainly got uh, a few bags of tricks that you like taking away yeah, with so you too. Remote communities, can you share? This is a bit of a show and some, tell. Some toys. Oh, um, good. The, the, for examining an eye, there is, you know, there is no uh, alternative to a slit lamp. And most slit lamps, as you probably know, are big devices that sit on a table on the clinical floor and the patient sits on one side and the examiner sits on the other. Well, this little gadget is, is a slit lamp. I won't put it totally together, but it, it's, I take that to clinics where I might be working in, for example, uh, a land care, a, a land council building, mm -hmm. seeing an Aboriginal community. So f for assessing things like um, the, the level of progress of cataract mm -hmm. or for looking at um, corneal or lens um, anomalies. You just need to have this little gadget. Now mm. it, it produces a slit illumination. I don't know whether you can see that there. Mm. Yeah, and that this little illumination passing through the transparent structures of the eye, mm. the examiner through the eyepieces sees that under a very high magnification. Mm. So you could almost see the cellular detail of the epithelium, mm. stroma, etc., and whether things are in the, are in the interior chamber. Um, you can't do everything with this little gadget, but it's certainly a lot better than not having one. And an awful lot cheaper than. Um it is a lot cheaper than the real thing, but it's certainly not cheap. <laughs> <laughs> so you don't want to drop that. So. <laughs> no. so we're coming now to our final case study, and it centres on Aidan, a 15-year-old farmer's son from a small rural town. Aidan was riding his quad bike. They're a risky little bike to be riding occasionally, aren't they, when they, he ran into a barbed wire fence. His left eyelid has a laceration, and he has ocular trauma with blood in the anterior chamber. His father has brought him in, holding gauze to his eye, which is bleeding. Now, Jill, what does a, a, a nurse practitioner, nurse, mm -hmm. uh, GP do in this instance? What are the key messages here? The golden rule is that a lid laceration is a penetrating trauma until proven otherwise. Mm -hmm. So if anything's protruding from the eye, um, certainly don't remove it. Don't put any pressure on it. Don't um, uh, make sure that certainly the patient doesn't vomit. That's one of the, the golden rules as well. And time a referral, urgent referral to an ophthalmologist. Mm -hmm. And for lid laceration, particularly it's around the lacrimal system, then there's certainly an urgent referral to an ophthalmologist for surgical repair is critical. Okay, so that's with the laceration and, mm -hmm. and any object in the eye. Yes. It's critical. So we've got the graphic up now, you can yeah. see that there's a nasty piece of wire. So certainly just lightly pad, no pressure, and uh, certainly urgent referral. And certainly mm. never pull it out. Never pull it so out. Just have to emphasise that again and again, don't yes. pull the object yep. out. And I guess the other point is that's a tetanus prone wound. Tetanus very much so. Yeah. Local tetanus, broad spectrum antibiotics, mm. antiemetics analgesia, certainly the patient would need to be fasted and then certainly refer. And, and we see lid lacerations with things like bike accidents, mm -hmm. vehicle accidents. Where else what might we see lid lacerations? Yeah, from glass, I said animal, animal bites, bites, animal bites, dog bites, human bites even. Human bites? It's amazing. Mm. <laughs>
<laughs> so, <laughs> so it can happen from any, any time. Mm. So the secret is to ensure that it's repaired correctly to prevent long-term complications for these patients down mm -hmm. the track. Mm -hmm. and, and what are some of the other common injuries that we see in, in rural communities apart from an object in the eye, penetrating yeah. trauma? Yeah, and certainly um, simple things like hammering metal upon metal, you know, lots of small intraocular foreign bodies, um, lots of those. Um, certainly uh, you can have any irregular pupil or any iris damage. Mm. Um, uh, so the graft's on there at the moment, but you'd think it might be a foreign body on the cornea, so should you remove that, yeah. then you can end up with a total hyphema and damage as well. Yeah. Jill, what are your thoughts, Jill, Jill Keefe, on that last, that last picture? Mm. Yes, it was you know, obviously it was part of the mm. iris you know, coming from you know, the puncture in the eye. Mm. Again, it's, don't take it out. But I think the really important message um, is in, particularly in urban areas in Australia, the um, rates of trauma have gone down incredibly um, that are work-related because of um, the um, employers having to ensure mm. the safe working conditions. So it really is an issue in rural areas that trauma is, is very different, um, the severity of it, mm. um, but the frequency, um, particularly because of the workplace um, requirements mm. um, of employers that um, yeah, the work that we've done and, and some things that we're looking at with um, WorkSafe in Victoria has just made an incredible difference in, mm. um, in what's happening. So it can be prevented as long as it's good protective eyewear. Mm. And, and how would you define good protective eyewear? If we were going to get that message out there to practitioners watching, what should we be telling our patients about that? There's some, some there's guidelines for that. So mm. for um, some of the you know, really um, dangerous, it's, it's a shield. Um, and particularly goggles that, um, you know, so that there's protection around the eyes. And um, yeah, so, and, and it's for things at home too, that mm. gardening or whatever, yeah. but yeah. yeah. The, yeah. important, the quality of the, um, the goggles or shields are, are critical. Because I guess a lot of people reckon that they can just put on a pair of sunnies or something, don't they, and get away with it. Is that what you find? Oh, people do that, uh, yes. but, but uh, that's you know, foolish and dangerous. Mm. And uh, if you go to the store, the hardware shop or wherever, where they're selling the protective eyewear, it, it has information about it or what type of situation it should be used. And, you know, if you're out there with a whippersnapper, uh, you know, it's different from if you're doing some heavy duty grinding uh, or welding. And so that you need to match your eye protection with the risky uh, uh, task that you're wanting to do. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, so really, I guess that we've got to get these messages of prevention out there. Yeah. And I suppose in the standard procedures, you talked before, Jill, about what should be done in that emergency situation. Mm -hmm. Can you just run that by us again to reinforce what we've, we've heard from you? Yeah, I think the, the most important thing is certainly if anything's protruding from the eye, don't remove it. Don't That's, remove anything Don't remove protruding. anything protruding. Don't put any pressure on it. Certainly lie the patient down. Stop nausea and vomiting. That's really critical. Pain relief, tetanus, broad spectrum antibiotic, and certainly urgent referral to an ophthalmologist for review. Mm -hmm. um, and so, in consultation with the ophthalmologist and your rural mm -hmm. rural team to get them to the nearest ophthalmic centre as, as quick as we can. Hugh, I, I can just see. wanted to say one thing on that yep. last photograph. We saw the key to that photograph was the pupil wasn't central yes. and circular. Mm -hmm. yep. yeah. it was displaced mm -hmm. and peaked. Yeah, look and, at that. Mm -hmm. And so you, you know you don't know what that is on the cornea just mm -hmm. looking at it, but that pupil tells you that you've got a penetrating mm -hmm. injury. Mm -hmm. That's yep. that's the key. In that that's uh, that's a beware. And I suppose on that topic of things that we really need to. Um, be mindful of and emergencies, I guess, in practice. I've just had another question through. Um, what are the worrying signs for retinal detachment? I know this is a slightly different area, but the questions come through. And is there anything I can do for patients suspected to have this condition in regions not well supported by ophthalmologists? Thanks, Melinda Thurton. Well, the uh, symptoms are uh, little black dots. Uh, but followed or with sparks or flashes of light in the eye, and they're the real key. Um, and then if you notice a veil or a balloon coming up over your vision or coming down over your vision, th those are the real mm. things. Mm. And you need somebody to look in the back of your eye to check it. Mm -hmm. Very commonly as people get older, the vitreous gel that fills up the eye, the eye is hollow like a mm. tennis ball, but instead of being full of air, it's full of this jelly. 
mm. it will collapse and form little lumps as it condenses over time. Mm. And that'll often give these little black spots that float around. Those on their own are not a problem. But if the gel sticks to the retina, it'll pull little holes in the retina yeah. and then the retina will just float off as a retinal detachment. Mm. But if you get those black dots, you need to go and have an eye exam. Mm. You know, an optometrist or an ophthalmologist, but a proper dilated retinal exam. And if there are problems seen there, then you do need to be referred to an ophthalmologist. Maybe just for laser treatment to seal around the hole, maybe for full-blown retinal detachment surgery to put it all back together. And is this an area perhaps where telehealth has a, has a role, that people will be able to take photographs with yeah. retinal yeah. cameras and yeah. send them through for an opinion? The retinal cameras tend to take great photos of the back of the eye, mm. but not such good photos of the peripheral parts of the back of the eye, which is where most of the retinal detachments start. Uh -huh. So the telemedicine might help, but you actually would have to be a very good operator of the retinal camera or the slit lamp mm. to get a good enough image to be able to send it back for the ophthalmologist to make a diagnosis. So you're better, to, with a retinal detachment, you get a, better to get the body to, or the person, to, or the eye, <laughs> to, to the mm. optometrist or ophthalmologist so they can do a proper mm. exam. Mm -hmm. John, what in your experiences is the case there with retinal detachment? Uh, yes, some, uh, I agree totally with what you said. Uh, However, sometimes you have other flashes. You can have zigzag flashes, which is more more a migraine. Oh, yeah. So I guess any new, any new type symptoms where it's a short time frame, where there's other risk factors for hemorrhage, so cardiovascular type symptoms that there may be hemorrhage at the back of the eye, mm -hmm. have a very low threshold to get them off because they may just have a, a vitreous hemorrhage, and the key to that is is there's a, a black dot that will tend to move slowly from time to time, but if it's associated with flashes, they have to go off because you can't exclude a, a, a detachment. Mm -hmm. Okay, and with, with something that's not quite as uh, serious as that, perhaps a, a, a lesser condition that a, a nurse practitioner or, or clinical nurse is treating, we've just had a, a question through from Shelley, who's a practice nurse in New South Wales. Any advice for rural patients following eye treatments, wearing eye pads, et cetera, for driving? Etc. So they've come in to see you for some condition that's required an iPad to be placed. What are we going to advise our patients about what they can do with that iPad? So yeah, who'd like to take that one? Certainly not driving Still. with an iPad on. Okay. Yeah. No, that's, that's, driving that's, with no driving that's with an right. iPad. That's, okay. that's, a, that's the first message. Yep. And if you really had to put an iPad on, we would show them how to do it, from the ointment and the pad to put on when they got home, if they really had to have an iPad on. But uh, certainly, um, it's it's a dangerous practice because your vision's changed on the side, your side vision, your depth perception. Um, it's it's just increased risk of falls. Uh, it's, it's just not worth it. So mm. we've actually gone away from using a lot of the iPads these days. Yeah. It's it's not it's not. It's also practice. illegal. So that yes, it's illegal. <laughs> so you you won't just uh, they're not a one eye driver. Ruin your health. Mm. Yeah. Exactly. Yes, exactly. arrested as well. well. One other common injury is flash burns from you know, the welding mm. and. You, you need to ask when, because they, they're probably going to have to have anaesthetic uh, in both. Mm. Uh, so you need to ask them, how are you going to get home if mm. I actually do numb your eyes mm. before we go ahead? <laughs> <laughs> and, and so I guess for a lot of practitioners out there who wish to upskill in, in the area of eye health, Jill, what, what sort of extra training is available for people to consider? Yeah, we certainly have the, the ACI has a, a roving um, emergency one day session and that is um, for all people across um, the state. Um, it's facilitated, it's a multidisciplinary course at, and it's uh, usually we try to keep it on a Friday if we can so it allows people <laughs> that to... That very <laughs> civilised so it can flow into a nice long weekend. Yeah. Yeah. So you can play golf on Thursday. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so we, we take it to them in the rural areas and it's, it, they can actually um, access that information on the ACI website once again as well mm -hmm. and they're run regularly throughout the year so the 2013 programs already underway. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's a fantastic option. Of course, not everybody can get to to a place to have training, but there are some other eye health programs on the Rural Health Education Foundation website that I can highly recommend: diabetic retinopathy, managing chronic diabetes complications, and a clear view improving Indigenous eye health. A wonderful program, and all these provide great resources, and they can be accessed by you for free. And so we're almost at the end of our program. We've covered a lot of ground, but let's uh, perhaps hear from our panel about some of their take-home messages. Hugh, we've heard from you on a range of topics, but what would be 
the thing that you'd like to leave with our audience tonight when it comes to eye well, health? Well, I think it's a topic we didn't really talk about. <laughs> and, but you just mentioned now, and that was about diabetes. And mm -hmm. as GPs and as, as primary care providers, we cannot let any of our patients with diabetes go for more than two years without having an eye exam. And mm. if they're indigenous, they need to have that eye exam every 12 months. Mm -hmm. mm. yeah. That's critical. And I, and I guess the thing is to get them on board with that process because very often they won't have symptoms. So as far as they're concerned, right. they're okay. Is but that what your experience right. is? Absolutely right. It needs, it needs to be built in. It's like getting a haemoglobin A1C you know, tested or a urine tested or something. It just has to be done. And if the GPs may do it themselves. They may have somebody with a retinal camera. They may refer them to the local optometrist or the visiting ophthalmologist. It doesn't matter who does it as long as it is done and done every two years for mainstream and every 12 months for Indigenous people. Fantastic. Yeah. And I guess on that note, as you say, we've, we've done that program on, on diabetes and eye health. And so if people would like to follow that up more, please go to our website. It's a very important point, though, for us to keep in mind. Uh, mm -hmm. It's also on that point of prevention, which Jill Keefe, I know, is a, is a topic very close to your heart. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure that your final words will be in that area. Am I right? Most certainly, yes. And, and I think it's recognising those risk factors as we talked about, you know, which is the population. And we've talked about age, um, we've talked about um, just diabetes, um, and our family history, really very important. So it, it's using the opportunity for people you know, over 40. Have you had an eye exam in the last five years? Over 50? in the last two years. Um, and if someone comes in, I mean, simply test their vision as well. And But even if vision is okay, still look at those risk factors and, and consider the need for referral. Mm, fantastic. Mm. Jill Grasso, yeah, so you sound as though you're, you're a woman that's always been out there spreading <laughs> the word. What's the word that you'd like to leave us with, or the words tonight? Certainly the important role of the ophthalmic nurse and the nurse within the healthcare mm. team um, in regards to education and support for the patients. They play a major role um, in there. The timely management and the for, for ocular trauma is critical, accessing resources, ac accessing the education um, and working within a team to ensure that we give our patients the best quality outcomes. Mm -hmm. John, you, you know all about teamwork. You know, so. working in a rural community with, with practitioners like Phil. What, what would you like to leave us with tonight? What uh, do you think is really important? Well, uh, always beware the unilateral red eye, <laughs> but increasingly in this day of teamwork, our patients are going to be chronic and ageing and mm. their blindness is likely to be asymptomatic. So we have to have a high index of suspicion to identify those at risk and make sure that they're having a regular eye, appropriate eye checks. Mm, fantastic. Mm. And Phil, you're in the lucky position of having the final <laughs> word here. Well, my final word is um, to just remind everyone who's a rural practitioner, you're part of a network, use that network, don't try and work in isolation. Uh, the might be a little bit banal, but uh, it's very important if you do send somebody off for an eye examination with an optometrist or an ophthalmologist, they'll probably have dilating drops, so they will need somebody to drive them there and drive them back, sunglasses and a hat. So that's a fairly technical but important point. Mm. Um, and this, this uh, chart which I mentioned uh, previously comes from the Macular Degenera Degeneration Foundation. It's got a, a magnet on the back of it mm -hmm. so that people who are at risk um, can put that on their fridge and test themselves as much as they like. <laughs> Fantastic. So, so I guess what we've got tonight is that real sense of teamwork as well mm. from mm. everyone here. Yeah. So thank you very much. Now, if you're interested in obtaining more information about the issue, issues raised in the program tonight, there are a number of resources available on the Rural Health Education Foundation website at rhef.com.au. And there you can also go to tonight's show, Eye Health The Current View. Go to our program webpage and click on the resources link. If you'd like more information about anything that you've heard tonight, you can also go to the NH. NHMRC website to access glaucom the glaucoma guidelines. Now they're quite substantial, aren't they? We were looking at them earlier and the supportive material, but well worth reading. If you're a health professional, don't forget to complete and send in your evaluation forms, very important, which can be found on the website. You'll receive a certificate of attendance and, if eligible, CPD points. Thanks to the Australian Government, Department of Health and Ageing for making this program possible, and thanks also 
to you to take, for taking the time to attend and contribute with all of your wonderful questions. And once again, thank you to our wonderful panel. It's been terrific to have you on board tonight. I hope thank that um, everyone else out there has learned as much as I have, and I've really enjoyed your company. Thank you. I'm Caroline West. Goodbye, and join us again next time. See you then. The Rural Health Channel broadcasts 24 hours a week. To see what other programs are showing on the Rural Health Channel this week and next, go to the Foundation's website and click on the RHC TV guide on the left-hand side.